Okay, then let's continue. Let's continue. Okay, next. We are going to talk about three possible solutions to lifelong learning. The first solution is called selective synaptic plasticity. From its name, you may not be able to know what exactly this method works. Synaptic means synapse, which is this the connection between nerves in our brain. This is called a synapse. What about plasticity? It means plasticity. So in a nutshell, what this method does is that we only let certain neurons in this neural network or some connections between neurons to be malleable. Selective means only part of the connection is malleable. Some links must be solidified. It must not be altered. Such method as this is also called the regularization-based method. The research of the regularization-based methods in the field of lifelong learning has the most complete development as far as I'm concerned. So we will spend more time talking about selective synaptic plasticity. What about the other two aspects? We will quickly go through them with only one or two pages of slides. You will find that the main problems in our homework also focus on the methods that is related to regularization based mentioned above. Okay, let's first think about the problem. Why will catastrophic forgetting happen? We assume that there are task 1 and task 2. For these two tasks, we assume that our model has only two parameters, theta 1 and theta 2. Of course, a model usually has millions or hundreds of millions of parameters. But let's assume there are only two parameters. Okay, the two pictures on this slide represent the loss function of task 1 and task 2. That is, on task 1, different values of theta 1 and theta 2 will give us different losses, as shown in this figure. We use color to denote the amount of loss. If the color is bluer, it means the loss is the bigger. If it's more white, oh wait. Ah, wrong. I'm sorry I just said the opposite. The bluer the color is, the smaller the loss is. The more white the color is, the greater the loss is. Okay, so the left and the right pictures corresponds to task 1 and task 2 respectively, which are their error surfaces. Okay. Let's first train the model on task 1. How to train the model for task 1? You have to have a randomly initialized parameter. We call it theta 0. Then we will use the gradient descent method to adjust the parameters of theta 0. Then you follow the direction of gradient to update the parameters of theta 0 and get theta b. Okay, let's assume that number of updates is enough. If you think that the loss has dropped low enough, you have finished learning task 1. Assuming that the learning of task 1 is completed, we get the parameter theta b. Next, we have to continue to solve task 2. You just copy the parameters from theta b. Copy it to the error surface of task 2. Pay attention. Although the error surface on the left and right are different, theta b refers to the same set of parameters. Theta b is the parameter trained with task 1. We use it for task 2 now. We now apply theta b to task 2 and continue to do training. On the task 2, we have a different error surface. According to the error surface of the task 2, we update our parameters. We might move theta b to the upper right corner and get theta star. Theta star is the parameter that has been trained on the task 1. And then the task 2. It is obtained after training these two tasks in order. Now we use theta star to represent the parameter obtained after training these two tasks in order. This theta star in the task 2 is at a relatively low position on the error surface, so its loss is also low. It will perform well on the task 2. But if you use theta star back to the task 1, you will find that you can't get a good result because theta star is only good at the task 2. It doesn't necessarily have a low loss on the task 1. That's why forgetting happened. How to solve this problem of forgetting? For a task, maybe there are many different positions, or maybe there are many different sets of parameters. For us to get a low loss, for the task 2, maybe in this blue oval, the performances are good enough. Maybe in this blue oval, the losses are all low enough. If we move theta b, instead of moving up right, but moving left, can the new parameter on the task 1 
avoid forgetting? This is what we will share with you later. Okay, how to do it? The basic idea is that every parameter has different importance on the previous learned tasks. There are some parameters which are particularly important for the previous tasks. We hope that when we learn on new tasks, those old parameters, those important parameters, won't change a lot. The new tasks only change those parameters that are not important to the previous task. Okay, let's assume that theta b is the parameter learned from the previous task. So theta b will perform good on the previous task. Then we let theta b continue to learn on the second task. In selective synaptic plasticity, in the method, we will give each parameter a guard, a bodyguard. We use bi to represent the guard. For each parameter theta i, it has a guard bi. The parameter here is the weight and the bias of each neuron. If your network has 1 million parameters, then there are 1 million bi. The bi of each parameter are different. Each parameter has its own guard. What does this guard stand for? The guard shows whether this parameter is important or not for the previous tasks. Okay, so now, on a new task, when we update our parameters, we will rewrite the loss function. Original loss function could be written as L of theta, but we will not directly minimize L of theta. If we directly minimize L of theta, catastrophic forgetting will happen. So what we have to do is to change our loss function. We have a new loss function, which is called L prime. This L prime is what we really want to minimize. This L prime is the original loss L added by one more term. What is this term? This term is that we first sum over all i, all parameters. Then, here theta i represents the unknown parameters, the parameters that we are going to learn. Parameters to be learning, subtract. Parameters learned from the previous task. Theta b i. Theta superscript b subscript i. Theta b is the model learned from the previous task. The subscript i is the ith parameter. We want to make theta i and theta b i as close as possible. So, we take the square of the result of theta i subtracted by theta b i. We will multiply a value called b i in the front. This b i is 2. Tell us how strongly we want theta i and theta b i to be as close as possible. If b i is large, we want theta i to be very close to theta b i. If b i is small, theta i doesn't need to be very close to theta b i. It doesn't matter. This L prime is what we want to optimize. There are two terms in L prime. One is the loss of the original new task, and the other is the term that make theta i and theta b i as close as possible. But be aware, we don't treat all parameters equally. All parameters do not need to get close equally. We only require theta to be close to theta b i in some parameters. Some parameters are close and some parameters are not. Which parameter should be close to theta bi is controlled by bi. If a parameter whose bi is very large, it should be close to the old parameter, close to the parameters learned in the previous task. If bi is equal to zero, we don't care about the difference between new parameters and previous parameters. So what if we set bi to zero? If we set the bi of all the parameters to zero, what does this mean? This means, we don't put any restrictions on theta i. There is not any constraint on the parameters. All parameters do not have to relate to previously learned parameters. In this case, it becomes normal training. And we'll have the problem of catastrophic forgetting. Since it is bad to set bi to zero, can we set bi to a very large value? All parameters. Give it a very large bi. Forgetting is not a problem anymore. But this is. Another extreme called intransigence. The meaning of intransigence is the unwillingness to compromise, the unwillingness to give in, and the stubbornness. Assuming that your bi is very big, the results you're learned will be very close to theta b. Your new parameters will be very close to the old ones. Your model may not forget the old task, but it is not good at learning the new tasks. It cannot learn new tasks well. This situation is called intransigence. So far, let's see if any students have questions to ask.
Some students said that, the sound is still blowing. Hope it's a lot better now. Hope it is much better now. Some students asked, whether BI needs to be set manually, or can be part of the learnable parameters. Okay. In the literature, BI is defined manually. The key technology in the research of lifelong learning lies in how we set this BI. Is it okay to learn the BI term? You can imagine that it is inappropriate to learn the BI term in this task. What will happen if you let the model to learn BI by itself? The BI term will eventually equal to zero since the model wants to make loss as small as possible. If you let the model learn BI by itself, then no lifelong learning can be done, leading to BI being a hyperparameter set manually. Here a crucial point emerges is that, how to find the proper BI? How do we know? What parameters are important for the old task? And what is not? This is the key point of the research in this domain. Here we only tell you the basic concepts of deciding BI. Think about it. How do you know whether a parameter is important to a task? Suppose you have trained a model, so you already have theta b. Inspect the impact that each parameter in theta b has on this task. For example, if you make theta b move along the direction of theta 1 and find out that there aren't many changes to the loss term, no effect on the loss. Thus, we should know theta 1 is not very important to task 1, and a arbitrary value can be assigned. Since theta 1 is not very important to task 1, Theta 1 can be changed arbitrarily. When learning a new task, a smaller value of bi will be assigned to theta 1. That is to say, the value of b1 will be smaller. On the other hand, if we move theta belong the direction theta 2, you will find that, when we change the value of theta 2, there's a huge impact on the loss term. It means that theta 2 is a very important parameter for task 1. You should not change it easily. You have to set the b of theta 2 to be larger. You have to set b2 to be larger. And this is the basic concept of selective synaptic plasticity. What will happen if you set a smaller b1 and a larger b2 when learning task 2? Since b1 is relatively small, we can update the model along this direction freely. On the other hand, since b2 is relatively large, it becomes hard to update the model along this direction. Overall, if we set b1 to be smaller, and b2 to be larger, then when you update theta b, it won't move in this direction, but instead in this direction, because we only want the model to update theta1, and leave theta2 alone. You may have to change the direction of your gradient. Originally, it looks like this. Change into this one, and get theta star. Then use theta star in task 1. Since task 2 only update the model along this direction, there are only small changes to the loss of task 1. Hence, using the new theta star here can prevent the degradation on task 1. This is a possible way to alleviate catastrophic forgetting. Here I'm going to show you a real experimental result from a paper. The result is from a paper called EWC and the link of the paper is also on the next page of the lecture slides. Please refer to it if you are interested. Okay, so what does the figure here say? This kind of the figure is very common. In the paper of lifelong leering, most of them has a similar figure in theor paper. What does the horizontal axis says? The horizontal axis represents the process of sequential training. On the left of the first dashed line, it refers to the training task A. Thus, we have three tasks, A, B and C. We first train task A, then train task B, and finally train task C. It is the result of training these three tasks sequentially. As for the vertical axes, there are three vertical axes. The first vertical axis represents the accuracy of task A. The second vertical axis represents the accuracy of task B. The third vertical axis represents the accuracy of task C. By drawing such a picture, you can see that. When we learn the three tasks, A, B and C, sequentially. For task A, B and C, these three tasks, how will their accuracy change? We first look at the task A. We first look at the changes in the task A. Okay, we first look at the blue line here. What is the blue line here?
The blue line here indicates the situation where we don't care. Catastrophic forgetting at all. And do normal training. Which is the case that BI is always set to zero. What happens if BI is always set to zero? You will find out the following. Looking at the accuracy of the task A. There is no problem in the beginning of learning the task A. And the accuracy is high there. Next, it starts to learn the task B. And the accuracy of the task A drops. Next, it starts to learn the task C. And the accuracy of the task A drops again. It is catastrophic forgetting. How about L2? L2, this experiment, is under the situation that the BI are all set to 1 for whatever parameters. If all the BI are all set to 1 on the task A, it actually prevents the problem of catastrophic forgetting. For example, you can look at the green line here. It does not drop much in the task B. And, in the task C, it does not drop much, either. When training on the task B, the accuracy of the task A does not drop much. When training on the task C, the accuracy of the task A does not drop much, either. However, always setting BI to 1 will give you a new problem, which is the intransigence issue we just mentioned. We could take a look at the learning status of task B and task C for the green line here. If BI is always equal to 1, when the model is learning on the task B, the accuracy of the task B doesn't rise high enough. For the second vertical axis here, it represents the accuracy of task B. Then, here is the situation when learning on the task B. When it is learning on the task B, it stands to reason that the accuracy of task B should soar. But it doesn't. The green line here does not soar. It can't learn it. It can't learn task B. And it's even worse when learning task C. It just can't learn it. The horizontal axis here is the situation when training on the task C. The vertical axis here is the accuracy of the task C. You find out that the accuracy of the task C is not higher than those with other methods. Which means that the task C can't be learned. This is intransigence. So, if you give all the parameters the same regularization, it might be too restrictive for your model to learn new tasks. Okay, what if we give different BI to different parameters? Some parameters are with large BI while some parameters are with small bi. That is, you only fix certain parameters and make the others flexible. Then you could get the red line here. For the red line here, it performs the best on every task. If you look at the task A, after learning three tasks sequentially, the accuracy does not drop. If you look at the task B, when learning the task B, the accuracy only drops a little bit comparing to the blue line. And then the task C will never drop again. If you look at the task C, the accuracy of the task C is a little bit lower comparing to the blue line. So, when you fix this BI, there will be some consequences that the new tasks are more difficult to learn. But the result is not as miserable as when all BI are set to 1. It's better than the results when BI are set to 1. Okay, in class, we didn't really say how BI is calculated. We only talked about the concept. In BI's code, various methods are implemented to calculate BI. What you have to answer in the multiple choice question is how the BI is obtained in every method. You can choose to read literature to know how BI is set. You can also choose to read BI's code directly to see how BI is set. We list a lot of methods here. To name a few, EWC, SI, MAS, there is RWAC, there is SCP. They are arranged chronologically. From the oldest method, to the newest method. Every method, has its own characteristics, has its own problem it wants to solve, and has its own points it considers. I leave this for you to discover. In the homework, we won't talk about this part in the class. Because if you are not, that interested in lifelong learning, going through every method, will be redundant for you. But if you are interested in lifelong learning, take a good look at the multiple choice questions of the homework. You can learn a lot. Okay, let's see if any classmates have questions. It seems that BI can be calculated directly. Correct. BI is directly calculated. But in terms of how is BI calculated, every method is different. 
Each method uses different data. Some method just uses the model's input, while some methods require the input and output. In other words, if it's an image classification problem, some methods need only the images in the past tasks to calculate BI. Some methods require the images and labels of the past tasks to calculate BI. BI will ask you if the method uses labels. Take a look at TA's code by yourself to see if labels are used. A classmate asked, will the training result differ if the order of training tasks has changed? What a brilliant question. The simple answer is yes. I will give you an example later to demonstrate that changing the order of the tasks will produce very different results. So you will find that in these papers, when they are doing experiments, they did not just do one sequence of tasks. They will enumerate all possible orders of tasks to do experiments and then take its average. That is, suppose you have three tasks. You can't just finish task A, B, C, get the average and say that it's the average of your method. In these papers, the common practice is to enumerate all the sequences A, B, C, C, B, A, B, C, A. Run through it all and get the average. Only then can the average represent how well your lifelong learning method is. Okay. This is regularization based method. Actually, before the regularization based method, there is another early practice called GEM, gradient episodic memory. This method is also a very effective one. It puts limitations, not on the parameters, but on the direction of the gradient update. How does GEM work? Here's how we do it. In task 2, we will calculate the gradient of task 2. But we have to be careful about whether we should follow the direction of the gradient calculated in this task to update our parameters. Before updating the parameters, we will go back to the task 1 first and calculate the direction. The update would be in. If we update it in task 1, we use the blue arrow to represent the update direction of parameter theta b in the task 1. If the directions of theta b and g are different, or in other words, their inner product is less than 0, what should we do? We modify g and turn it into g prime. The criterion of this modification is that we hope to find a new g prime that would have an inner product with g b that is greater than or equal to 0. Moreover, g prime and g can't be too different. So, originally, if we update in this direction, catastrophic forgetting may occur. But, we deliberately modify the direction of the update and change it from G to G prime. This way, we can alleviate the problems caused by catastrophic forgetting. Now, have you noticed that something doesn't add up? Is there anything weird about it? Think about it. How is GB calculated? To get GB, we have to calculate the gradient in the task one which means we have the data of task 1. If we didn't have the data of task 1, we would have no way to figure out GB at all. So, one of the disadvantages of the GEM method is that it needs to save the information of the past method. This deviates a bit from what lifelong learning is trying to pursue. Like what we said at the beginning, the spirit of lifelong learning is that we don't want to save all the past information. If all the past data are saved, the data would accumulate as time goes by. And eventually we won't be able to save all the past data. So GEM is a bit contrary to the spirit of lifelong learning. Although it stores the past data. Maybe the problem is not that serious. Why is that? That's because the GEM method only needs to save a very small amount of data. The main purpose of GB is to modify the direction of G. So. Maybe when we're calculating GB, a very large amount of data is not required. Just a portion of the data needs to be saved. So, what GEM is trying to achieve is to avoid catastrophic forgetting by saving a bit of data. That's why GEM seems a bit unfair when compared to other methods we just mentioned, such as EWC. It secretly stores additional data. 
But if you think about it, regularization based methods, such as EWC, also require additional storage to store the old model and BI. So, the regularization based methods we mentioned earlier also need to take up extra space to store the old model and the value of BI. So, even if GEM needs to save some old data, as long as the amount of memory occupied by the old data is less than the size of BI in the old model, it might still be acceptable. That's why GEM is also an acceptable method, if not too much extra data is stored. Next, let's quickly go through two other methods. The first method is additional neural resource allocation. That is, we'll change the neural resource used in every task. What does that mean? One of the earliest methods is called progressive neural networks. Its idea is like this. You obtain a model after finishing the task 1 while training on the task 2. Do not change the old model anymore. Create another network whose input includes the hidden layer output of the previous model so task 2's model can make use of the useful information from task 1 if there is any but do not change the parameters learned from task 1 anymore only the additional parameters can be modified similarly for task 3 we add another set of parameters for task 3 while training task 3 the parameters trained in task 1 and task 2 are fixed this is a promising solution to catastrophic forgetting. Actually, you won't encounter this problem at all because the old parameters are fixed. But there is still a problem in this method. For every task, you need extra space for the additional neurons. Therefore, your model size increases rapidly. Eventually, you will run out of memory if you give too many tasks. To the model, the model's size will blow up, and that size might be too big to fit in your memory resources. So, progressive networks does not solve catastrophic forgetting completely. But when the amount of tasks is not large, progressive networks can still come in handy. There is another method called packed net, it is the reverse of progressive networks. Previously, we add neurons when a new task comes in. But PackNet does not do this. It creates a relatively large network at the beginning. Then, we are only allowed to use part of it for every task. The circles in these pictures indicate the parameters of the network. For example, you are only allowed to use the black border circles for task 1, for task 2. Only the orange circles are being trained for task 3. The black border circles and the orange circles are fixed, while the green circles are being trained. Now, the amount of parameters does not increase as the number of tasks increase. But this method is simply dodging the issue of progressive networks. This method just created a larger network and allow you to use only part of it for every task. Then you won't suffer from catastrophic forgetting. But eventually the memory you created for the network will still run out. That's nothing different from progressive network. But pack net and progressive networks can be combined. The combining method is also a well-known method called CPG. Compacting, picking, and growing. It works as the following. For our model, you can add new parameters. And you also only retain some of the parameters that can be used for training. We won't go into details of these methods. I'll leave it to everyone to study. Okay, let me see. Does any classmate have questions to ask? Okay, I think there are no questions. Let's continue. Okay, then the third approach is called memory replay. The third approach is very intuitive. We talked about that. If we put all the data together, there will be no catastrophic forgetting problem. But we also said that we can't save past data. Then, we simply train a generative model. This generative model will generate pseudo data. So, in this method, although we can't save the past data, we can still train a generative model.
to generate data that are similar to the past training data. In other words, we now have training data for the first task. We not only train a classifier to solve task 1, we train a generator at the same time. It will generate the data of the task 1. Next, when you are training on the task 2, if you only input the data of the task 2 to the machine, it may have the problem of catastrophic forgetting. But, you can't take out the data of task 1. What to do then? Use the generator to generate the data of the task 1. You use this generator to generate the task 1 data. And then use the data to train the classifier of the task 2. So, during the training, this classifier not only sees the data of task 2, but also sees the data of task 1 generated by the generator. By using this method, you can avoid the catastrophic forgetting problem. Next, you have data for the task 2 again. Maybe you will put the generated data of the task 2 and the task 1 together. Put these pseudo data together to train another generator. This generator can generate data of the task 1 and the task 2 at the same time. This process can keep going. Okay, is this method reasonable? Different people have different opinions. Because you need to train another generator. This generator will take up some space for sure. But if the space of this generator is smaller than the space of storing data, then maybe this is an effective method. In fact, our laboratory has also done some studies on lifelong learning. In our experience, this method of generating data is very effective. By using this method of generating data, you can often approach the upper bound of lifelong learning. You can get similar results with multitask learning. Next, you can think about the scenarios of lifelong learning we just talked about. We all assume that the required model is the same for every task. We even force that the amount of data required by the classifiers that we need to train are all the same. Assuming that the different tasks have different numbers of classes, is there a way to solve it? The first task has 10 classes. The second task has 20 classes. The third task has 100 classes. When you train for a new task, you also have to add new classes. Is there a way to solve it? There is a solution. Here are some documents. For example, learning without forgetting, and LWF, and ICARL, which is incremental classifier and representation learning. These are the references. The teaching assistant has put it in our homework. In the multiple choice questions of lifelong learnings homework, we also ask everyone the questions about these practices. If you are interested, you can read these papers by yourself. Actually, the lifelong learning we are talking about today, which is also called continual learning, is just a small piece of the research. In the entire lifelong learning field, it's just one of the situations. Actually, lifelong learning, or continual learning, has many different situations. You can read the literature below. It will tell you that lifelong learning has three scenarios. What we are talking about today is the simplest one. Among the three scenarios, it's the easiest one. How to solve the remaining two situations that is more challenging? What are the other two more challenging situations? We left it in the multiple choice questions. You can see what the other two scenarios look like by yourself. Okay, these are the three research directions about lifelong learning. A classmate asked, if we change the order of learning the tasks, will there be very different results? Yes, there will. Let me give you a specific example to explain. In the example of lifelong learning, we mentioned at the beginning that we let the machine learn this kind of noisy picture first. Next, it learns about the pictures without noise. But on the contrary, if you learn the pictures without noise first, and then learn about noisy pictures, what will happen? If you let the machine learn the noise-free picture first, it has 97% correctness on the task 2. However, it only has 62% correctness on the task 1. It seems that it can solve the classification of pictures without noise. But it can't handle noisy pictures. But if you further let the machine learn the task one, you will find that 
it can do well on both tasks. At this time, there's no problem with catastrophic forgetting. So it seems that the order of tasks is important. In some order, there will be problems with forgetting. In some order, there is no problem with forgetting. Finding out what kind of order is good and what order is effective for learning. It's called curriculum learning.